Our next presentation will focus on the work of an influential American social critic and historian, including what we might learn from him today. It's titled, Haven in a Heartless World, Christopher Lash's Democratic Hope. Eric Miller is professor of history and director of the honors program at Geneva College in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania. He is the author of Hope in a Scattering Time, A Life of Christopher Lash, published by Eerdmans here in Grand Rapids, as well as Glimpses of Another Land, Political Hopes, Spiritual Longing, published by Cascade Books. With John Fay and Jay Green, he also co-edited Confessing History, Explorations in Christian Faith and the Historian's Vocation, published by the University of Notre Dame Press. Miller has won both the Excellence in Teaching and in Scholarship Awards at Geneva College. His writing has appeared in a range of periodicals, including Commonweal, The Christian Century, and The Philadelphia Inquirer. Please help me give a warm welcome to Eric. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming this weekend. It really is. I've been thinking about this statement last night that this is the only place that they know of in America where you can, I mean, where we've, we, we have these kinds of conversations and it's a, it's a treat. So Haven in a heartless, heartless World, Christopher Lash's Democratic Hope. Christopher Lash witnessing what he, in, 19, in a 1993 letter to his father called Bill Clinton's bumbling start, remarked, when I hear the word progressive, I reach, if not for my revolver, for my industrial strength earmuffs. <laughs> Twelve years before, just after the election of 1980, he had confessed to his parents that at the last minute he had switched his vote from third party candidate Barry Commoner to Jimmy Carter, despite his deep disaffection with the one president who had sought his counsel. I couldn't live with the thought of helping to elect Reagan, he wrote. Needless to say then, Christopher Lash, who never budged from either of these estimates, would have found bemusing the very title, Progressive Conservative Summit. I suspect it would have provoked the kind of drollery he mainly reserved for letters, not to mention some gratuitous needling. His father was, after all, a very eminent uh, and dedicated progressive. But I do believe Lash would have taken to the idea of a summit, even one gathering progressives and conservatives. High purpose was Lash's daily bread, though not high in the sense of austere or exclusive. Rather, it was high purpose in the sense of the noble, necessary, and good that characterized his restless search for a way to capture the beyond for the here, to land the ideal and the actual. His long public quarrel with both the left and the right centered in large part on the conviction that both sides had fallen away from a vision or better, an argument that might direct Americans toward their truest hopes, their highest purpose. Um, that, that was his contention. In one of his most convincing criticisms of traditionalist conservatism, he in his 1991 book, The True and Only Heaven, contended that, quote, the, the reassuring effect of custom in hiding the terrors of existence behind familiar associations and routines so highly prized by Burkean conservatives at the same time deprives us of fresh experience of, quote, within a quote, an original relation to the universe, as Emerson would have put it. Lash believed American politics across the spectrum suffered from precisely this deprivation of new perspectives and fresh relations. What Lash described as Carlyle's response to the French Revolution, not a, quote, hideous mistake, but rather a missed opportunity to get to the bottom of things, that was Lash's own reading of the American public square. This was the mistake, not getting to the bottom of things, that he and his career and indeed his life wished not to make. So I believe that indeed a summit of this sort, an opportunity to get to the bottom of things, would have appealed to Lash, though his standards for it would have been higher than his hopes. With his close friend, Jean Beth Gielstein, he had in the late 80s tried unsuccessfully to plan a conference that would bring radicals and conservatives together 
to take up the question of capitalism and culture. And after attending a similarly themed conference, First Things editor Richard John Newhouse convened in 1989, Lash left disappointed with the purpose and quality of the meeting. Neoconservatives of this stripe were a lot more interested in capitalism than cultural conservatism, he wrote to a friend. He was ideologically lonely, not an all an unusual experience by then. Lash's idiosyncratic stance was the unanticipated fruit of a lifetime of small r Republican devotion and small d Democratic hope, built on the grounding assumption Thomas Paine had so successfully grafted into the national psyche that since, quote, every spot of the old world is overrun with oppression, America must step forward as an asylum for mankind in Paine's yet resounding words. 200 years after Paine's charge, Lash would echo it. What has become of the early Republican dream, he wondered aloud. Lash's father, a Pulitzer Prize winning editorial writer for three major Midwestern dailies, and his mother, a PhD in philosophy, had raised him as a believer not in God, but politics, especially capital D democratic politics. Facing the peril of the draft as a senior at Harvard in 1954, he reflected in a letter to a girlfriend on, quote, the ideals which are so buried in me and are probably the unforgettable heritage of a liberal upbringing. He remembered the voice of Roosevelt, which made you afraid, or which made you not afraid. <laughs> and you never really believed that he could hardly walk. And the death of Roosevelt with the radio commentator having to stop, and you realized suddenly that he could not go on because he was crying and knew that even radio announcers cried when a man died. And you were crying too for a man you didn't even know, whom you had never met and whose hand you had never shaken, although your father had shaken his hand and would tell you about it if you asked him. Lash's childhood formation had by age 21 left his life charged with meaning and motion, but also with questions. Questions that would plunge him into the depths of Western intellectual history and into the center of political debate. Lash prefigured his own variant of long loneliness in this same 1954 letter. It is at these times, he concluded, when I realize I'm not alone, but a part of America, whatever that means, except that the one thing it means is that wherever I go, I cannot be, I cannot uh, not be a part of it. It's at these times that I feel most alone. Meaning, solidarity, and absence in, in the American milieu in this would-be democratic haven created in him an admixture of no uncertain volatility, as his writing from the beginning would show. When Lash won the attention of intellectuals with his 1965 book, The New Radicalism in America, his fusing of political peak and analytic intelligence came together in a rhetorical style that updated with unusual verve the form of the Jeremiah, and he regularly delivered them to the First Church of the Republic, by then a diffuse and fracturing congregation, to be sure, but one still more or less on speaking terms. So Citizen Lash sought to address it. He spoke to the congregation as one, as well as to its factions, in his early years, he took aim at his own kind first as he migrated from the Democrats' left wing to the neo-Marxian left. In mid-passage, he and the new radicalism scored the liberal and radical intellectuals for their long history of claiming to serve rationality but aiming instead for power. Independent learning and critical thought, the vocational imperative of the intellectual to lash, had been swallowed up in the network of the national purpose and self-compromised by elite power circuits that had little interest in criticism and analysis, but much investment in what he called the diffusion of official attitudes. The true national purpose, last charged, was submerged beneath more typical and tawdry political ends, and those whose responsibility was to point in better directions were too invested in the same project to notice any problems. If liberalism more and more resembled conservatism, he wrote, it was because the intellectuals for the first time had something material to conserve. 
This dim portrait of both liberals and radicals consorted with Lash's general sense of what he called the dehumanization of modern life. The heartless world had clearly overtaken the haven from within. Futility and desperation lead many to withdraw. Lash, true to his upbringing, didn't withdraw so much as step back. As he began, along with so many, to recast the American circumstance through Marxist eyes. Alongside, if not quite a part of the new left, Lash sought a future for the nation in radical transformation, though not in the mystically revolutionary fashion many of the younger radicals embraced. Lash and his small but smart circle aimed to forge a left that in the face of a collapsing capitalist order would slowly win the argument by dint of its own intellectual and moral integrity. A humane and democratic socialism must emerge, he wrote at the end of his 1969 book, The Agony of the American Left, with a demand not merely for equality and justice, but for a new culture, absorbing but transcending the old, Haven realized, Haven restored. Suicidal impulses, though, are not very easily stayed, and new cultures are very rarely made. Lash's premonitions of the, na of the nation's courts only quickened as Nixon, Vietnam, stagflation, and more revealed the face of post-60s America. With political movement restricted and ideological advance stalled, Lash found himself turning in directions that would finally lead him neither to neither the left nor right, rather that would lead him in some fundamental sense deeper into both the left and the right. And keeping his eye trained on the nation, he would discover a hard-won political wisdom that would help him put the dominant ideological perches in their place and move him toward a stance that was, yes, idiosyncratic, perhaps, but perhaps also more finally true. A part of this emergent stance had to do with Lash's embrace of philosophic and indeed intrapsychic tension as an end as a state in which human beings paradoxically must learn to rest. This is an ancient form of wisdom, to be sure, but the kind of wisdom of which a linear, scientific, progressive civilization had lost sight in its race to defeat limits, so fostering another ethos and end. Lash seems to have come to this bedrock belief in salutary tension in part by way of Freud, whose profound sense of human limitation and inner division provided as the 60s receded solace for Lash and indeed hope of another variety, the kinds of sweeping spiritual consolations that had, as he in 1976 put it, infected American aspirations with delusional expectations of life were hardly the kind that would lead to mental stability, let alone political sanity. Against these romantic fantasies, Lash grew increasingly convinced that human well-being requires a difficult guarding of limits, from the personal to the familial, from the social to the political, from the economic to the ecological, a guarding beset with inescapable tensions. Such difficult ends were predicated on the ability of communities to, in disciplined and chastened fashion, deny elemental human instincts in the hope of compensating satisfactions that would prove more enduring than those consumer capitalism was so successfully and cynically proffering. Not surprisingly, as Lash began to write from, this, from within this worldview in the 1970s, conservatives took note. It was a form of moral realism, parts of which, at least, they identified as their own. The National Review's George Gilder, review, reviewing Haven in a Heartless World, the family besieged in 1978, praised it as a marvelously reactionary book. In it, Lash had developed a theoretically dense defense of the traditional family rooted in Freudian assumptions about the pathway human maturity requires a lifetime of thick, enduring relations between parents and children. Absent these relations, contended Lash, pathological patterns would ramify in ways that would inevitably threaten democracy itself, with citizens diminished to subjects and the nation, accordingly, taking on, taking on a centralized authoritarian shape, as was, in fact, happening, he claimed. It was this portrait of the nation that he would famously paint in the culture of narcissism, his historical case 
for the contemporary triumph of this haven-destroying, path pathology-inducing state. But the right could only, go uh, could only go so far down this trail with Lash because for him it was not simply an overreaching state that had helped weaken American institutions. It was corporate capitalism that was engineering what Lash called the invasion of the family via ever-expanding extra-familial nodes of every day, every minute, dependency. The, the, the dependency that eroded parental authority and weakened the possibility of necessary presence and embrace. For Lash, a right that persisted in calling for society based on intact families and on stable institutions more generally, while at the same time empowering the market's overpowering expansion, was delusional at best and cynical at worst. And he told them so, face to face, when possible, as Newhouse could attest. So Lash's stance on capitalism was a barrier to the right, no surprise to him, of course. What was far more painful was the rejection of the left, which was at first bewildering and then became simply a source of suffering, a lasting grief. The left's quarrel wasn't with Lash's antagonism to capitalism. It was with the moral vision that lay beneath Lash's opposition to capitalism. Lash wasn't content to condemn greed. He wasn't satisfied with the mere redistribution of property. He, aligning himself closer to earlier Republican theorists like Montesquieu, pushed instead for some form of moral traditionalism as the bedrock of any would-be Republican haven. But the left, of course, was rapidly heading in the opposite, more libertarian direction, as had become clear to him by the late 60s. As far as the left was concerned, Lash, with his ambiguous moral conservatism, had dug his own grave. So in terms of the broad and influential political movements of his day, Lash ended up on the outside. Neither his vision of a haven nor his reading of the larger threatening world won majority approval, as it were, and his ratings were especially low when his reading of the haven and the broader world were fused into a historical argument about the American past. That Lash was brilliant, that he demanded a certain level of careful attention, on this all agreed. But his appreciation, this appreciation did not add up to an argument one. He, in the end, found no way to join his politics to our politics, as it were, in a way that yielded the influence any intellectual seeks, although his writing continued to attract serious readers, as this conference shows. Where then does the curious case of Christopher Lash leave us today in 2018 here in Trumpistan, as a Brazilian friend calls our land, Trumpistan, <laughs> nearly 25 years after Lash's death? What do his life, his example, his stance have to say, not to people in his corner, but to all of us, left, center, and right, gathered for a summit, presumably in hope of the high Republican purpose Lash honored? Lash's name got flashed around by both left and right in the shocking aftermath of the Trump triumph. Steve Bannon claimed Lash as an inspiration. Lash's former students shrieked when that happened. Ross Douthat listed Lash's final posthumously published book in 1994, The Revolt of the Elites and the Betrayal of Democracy, in his Times column on books for the Trump era. The website Public Books included Lash and Trump Syllabus 3.0. All this attention centered on Lash's long-held contention that at the heart of the American story burned an aged conflict between the elite, cosmopolitan, modernizing, educated classes, and what in the culture of narcissism he referred to simply as the common man. Those who found themselves, whether by birthright, fate, or choice, beyond the pale of the emergent and increasingly dominant professional and managerial class. Lash was himself not satisfied with these kinds of designations. He knew the nomenclature, populism, elites, educated classes, was rough and reductive, language that concealed as well as revealed. But he was also convinced that such naming, as spelled out in a carefully developed context, was true enough and was necessary in order to grasp what was playing out with such evident effect in the nation. 
As the radicalism of the 60s dissipated, Lash had begun to formulate his thesis of cultural conflict in the course of the work that led to Haven and Narcissism. At a 1974 symposium sponsored by the American Association of Higher Education, Lash had described, quote, the emergence of two cultures, one based on technique and critical self-awareness and the re refinement of exact knowledge, the other based on stubborn popular resistance to the spread of modernity. This conflict was the source, he suggested, of what he called the cultural civil war raging around us, and his sympathies were clearly with the resistance. The educational avatars of cultural modernism had incited what he called the plebeian revolt against modernity with the arrogance of conquering lords seeking to quicken the dissolution of provincial, familial, and local loyalties in the name of personal liberation and technique. His framing of the historical moment stunned the panel's moderator, <laughs> his friend and erstwhile ally, Norman Birnbaum, uh, who actually reviewed my book in The Nation. So if you're interested in figuring out like how his former allies looked at his story laid out that way, it's an interesting read. Birnbaum admitted, per the published transcript, to being, quote, genuinely bewildered by Lash's contention that a large segment of American society is more reality-oriented than our culturally saturated elites. But here, Lash stood and kept standing. If in the 70s, Lash found Foucault useful in the construction of his argument about elite domination, he made recourse to Alistair McIntyre in the 80s to construct a more hopeful prescription as his plebeian revolt turned to an instantiation of what he began to call the populist tradition, to which he turned for historically embodied hope for the realization of the Republican haven. He reached toward a past of interconnected assumptions, practices, and institutions dedicated in the face of the assault of progress to preserving a lineage that in the true and only heaven he characterized as preoccupied with both preserving a sense of limits, yet also guarding a disposition that asserts the goodness of life in the face of its limits. Lash contended that within this ontological framework can emerge a recognizably distinct populist way of life, characterized by preoccupations, as he put it, with the habits of responsibility associated with property ownership, the self-forgetfulness that comes with immersion in some all-absorbing all -absorbing piece of work, the danger that material comforts will extinguish a more demanding ideal of the good life and the dependence of happiness on the recognition that humans are not made for happiness. He applauded it as a difficult but necessary stance and one at odds with the progressive assumptions that had so debilitatingly prevailed. There are many lines of objections to Lash's historical and ideological formulation of the populist tradition. The most convincing centered is on his to me, centers on his location of the tradition, or as he more weakly but accurately put it, sensibility, in the lower middle class. One year ago, amidst the Trump triumph, one of Lash's final students, the historian Kevin Matson, took to the Chronicle of Higher Education to declare his own rejection of Lash's belief in a politically promising and morally virtuous lower middle class. Matson charged Lash uh, with a tendency to generate what looks like an identity politics around class, a species of analytic overreach that to Madsen was historically misleading and politically unuseful. Lash's residual neo-Marxism, Madsen suggested, had led him to locate hope in a white working class that possessed considerably less nobility and much more taint than Lash imagined. Lash had anticipated such criticisms. He acknowledged the narrowness and provincialism of lower middle class culture, recognizing that it had, quote, produced racism, nativism, anti-intellectualism, and all the other evils so often cited by liberal critics. But what critics across the spectrum missed, Lash underscored, was the extent to which the liberal cosmopolitan tradition had dislodged and weakened the Republican virtues that had truly held purchase in key pockets in the American past. 
as a true and only heaven ably showed. If in late 20th century America, the practices and habits of mind Lash was lauding were in fact eroding among the people, and he did not deny they were, it had a lot to do with the absence of these very ideals in the Victorian progressive tradition whose liberality was not liberating enough. Quote, having been effectively excluded from public debate on the grounds of their incompetence, most Americans no longer have any use for the information inflicted on them in such large amounts. They have become almost as incompetent as their critics have always claimed, he wrote. He went on to denounce those nativist demagogues who exploited such divisions, resentments, and general melees for untoward political ends. Still, Lash's qualifications did not quite remove the questions these objections raised, and his argument did not, in the end, inspire confidence, even for his sympathizers, that the lower middle class was adequate to carry this populist tradition into the public square in a way that would meet the challenges he had himself laid out. Lash was, Lash's was, I think, a desperate historical argument made in the hope that having grasped the historical landscape, at least some elites with real institutional power might rethink their ideo ideological commitments and begin to construct with renewed appreciation points of real political connection with ordinary Americans rather than seeing such a broad swath of the electorate as fodder for their own less than civic purposes. It was, as he himself put it, a hope against hope. But there is real hope, I believe, in Lash's theoretical and historical work on populism. If his populism cannot bear the weight the notion of tradition requires, particularly in McIntyre's thick understanding of it, his populism, it stands before us as a kind of Republican ideal. For populism to serve as any kind of ideological focal point, it must, of course, have a past to which to refer. But this past need not be conceived as a singular tradition congealing within a particular class. The economist Donnie Roderick, in a recent uh, Times op-ed, suggests a more fruitful way of framing populism when he concludes, for instance, that the bad kind of populism spawned by globalization may require a good kind of populism to fend it off. What Roderick terms an ongoing reaction against globalization has over the decades taken different forms. It is, in turn, an ideological impulse that needs to be understood and guided by the kind of wisdom any human endeavor requires. If a class element is inevitably a part of the populist response, the populist ideal need not be chained to such particular manifestations and forms. Indeed, the populist ideal survives them all. And this ideal is centered on many of the affirmations Lash teased out and developed with learning, intelligence, and judgment. The economic part of the ideal, which Roderick emphasizes, uh, as he puts it, the populist yearning to reassert national ec economic control, was utterly central to Lash, though he wrote little about tariffs, trade policy, and steel. And it, Excuse me, it is Lash's particular economic focus that provides a way into the center of his populist proposal and indeed his entire politics. At the core of the populist ideal for Lash was meaningful work. But this was not work for the sake of growing the economy, but rather for growing the citizenry. In the moving autobi autobiographical ch opening chapter of The True and Only Heaven, already quoted today, uh, Lash writes of his discovery by the 1970s that his own children, despite their enviable socioeconomic positioning, were bound to experience deep vocational frustration. Quote, politics, law, teaching, medicine, architecture, journalism, the ministry, they were all too deeply compromised by an exaggerated concern with the bottom line to attract people who wish simply to practice a craft or having attracted them by some chance to retain their ardent loyalty in the face of experiences making for discouragement and cynicism. This degradation of work had further degrading effects, not the least of which was its leveraging of consumerism as the only available lifestyle option. 
So Alashian populism foregrounds an economy founded upon callings, as he, following the Puritans, termed it, callings in service to the community and the soul at once. The proposal's, this proposal's obvious good and evident justice alone should be enough to awaken, to awaken any number of reform movements, left, center, right, as we who are parents and teachers watch those in our care, watch we ourselves, struggle against the systemic forces that continue to threaten medicine, politics, engineering, schooling, the academy, and more, not to mention the earth. An economy that motivates us by the merest satisfactions while stripping away the very foundation upon which the whole elaborate scheme stands deserves scorn, a scorn manifested in movements away from it. Happily, there is much evidence of such movement, as for instance in the kinds of now ordinary localism that in my decaying mill town, to give just one example, have led to a farmer's alliance, new businesses of a decidedly civic caste, and an energetic community development corporation. It's heartening, and it's exactly what Lash knew we need. Participation, not distribution, is the test of democracy, he wrote. And without a sound, civically-oriented economy, democracy is fatally compromised. But Lash also knew we need, alongside economic participation, political participation, if the global threat of the industrial colossus is to be stayed. Movements with power to affect national and, in and international change. Formally democratic institutions do not guarantee a workable social order, he warned. Populism became his way of evoking the ideal of a republic peopled with those whose institutions, practices, and ethos reflect the hope of civic virtue. Democracy is not an end in itself, he wrote following Whitman, it has to be judged by, a, by its success in producing superior goods, superior works of, of art and learning, a superior type of character. It must foster a spirit and stance that directs citizens toward combating the malign powers uh, and the development of a way of life centered on the fostering of the basic human decency he so admired one of the indicators of which would be not just political, but also economic equality. Did Lash believe the liberal framework itself to be adequate for the moral and social ideals he cherished? Would Lash today number among the post-liberals, convinced that liberalism itself has proved to be the enemy of the very ideals upon which the republic has been centered? The discourse that most immediately shaped Lash's final ide ideological positioning was communitarianism, which was rooted in a vigorous post-60s critique of the liberal tradition. Initially enthusiastic about the communitarian turn in political thought in the 1980s, Lash later developed a charged critique of it, to which he juxtaposed populism for, among other things, its, its willingness to assert positions on, as he wrote, controversial issues like affirmative action, abortion, and family policy. The, privatization, the privatization of morality is one more indication of the collapse of the community, he continued, and a communitarianism that acquiesces in this development, at the same time calling for a public philosophy, cannot expect to be taken very seriously. Still, he lauded communitarian critics of liberalism like Michael Sandel and echoed many of their concerns, which he had himself been raising from his doctoral dissertation on. By the 1990s, he joined other critics of liberalism in denouncing, quote, our impatience with anything that limits our sovereign freedom of choice. And he looked at our refusal to draw a distinction between right and wrong with disdain. He called for, quote, a revisionist interpretation of American history one that stresses the degree to which liberal democracy has lived off the borrowed, borrowed capital of moral and religious traditions antedating the rise of liberalism. But Lash was not at core an architectonic thinker, and governing structures never held his attention for long. I think this had much to do with his deeper attunement to our existential condition, that quality of mind and spirit that led him as a young man to aspire to become a novelist rather than a scholar. <clears throat> 
For Lash, no framework could prove finally equal to the challenge of ameliorating what we, as human beings, are. If it's a haven we need, he knew, the mere form of the haven itself would not be enough. The frame was necessary, but it was not sufficient for what ails us. If by the time of his untimely death, Lash continued to rest restlessly within a liberal frame, it's because his eye wasn't fixed on it. His eye was rather on us, and he knew that we need more than what any system can offer. And as much as Lash remained a liberal Democrat, he was convinced that the survival of democracy required inspired political movements capable of relentless pushing toward difficult, impossible aims centered on decency, justice, virtue, and beauty. Such unusual political pressure, he believed, can only come from movements fired with religious purpose and a lofty conception of life. He was thinking, among others, of the civil rights movement, which he considered a manifestation of the populist tradition. In calling for such visionary political movements, he walked a tense line, the line between barren idealism and cynical realism. But this is precisely where he lived, or better, where he believed we live, truly live. The renunciation of messianic political visions he had in 1974 declared must not kill off the idea of spiritual rebirth. This idea must not be allowed to fade, end quote. That statement highlights the tension Lash believed to mark life itself. If spiritual rebirth was necessary for him, it was due to the condition in which we find ourselves, what he concluded his 1984 book, The Minimal Self, by calling our fallen state. The terrors of the inner life, the faltering sense of self that he referred to in the culture of narcissism were besieging us with unusual ferocity in an age that was experiencing what he called the collapse of personal life. Human beings beset with a self that is inexorably and painfully divided, as he put it, following James, Freud, Niebuhr, and others, must not evade this difficult condition whether by means of pessimistic or optimistic strategies of psychic survival. The confidence that, quote, change in political structures without an attendant spiritual or, or cultural transformation will bring about a genuine democratic society is an illusion, he wrote following Jacques Ellul, the political illusion. What spiritual rebirth came to mean for Lash is a long and winding trail one I can't profess fully to know but it is surely significant that the central and longest chapter of the true and only heaven features a luminous and intricate meditation on the belief he saw was utterly foundational to his populist tradition, a personal and communal affirmation in the midst of evil and suffering in the final ontic reality of goodness. The ability of historical communities to center their life on a collective affirmation of the final and superintending goodness of life in the teeth of its limits, as he put it, had in his view led populists to their modest but fruitful politics of gratitude. Those who lacked this faith, he believed, tended toward finally impossible and self-defeating hopes and programs, a politics of despair however progressive the intent. The lineage of those who profess what Lash termed the philosophy of wonder was comprised of unlikely friends, Edwards and Emerson, Milton and James, Brownson and King. Affirming the goodness of being in the face of suffering ill will and harsh turns had helped create the spiritual conditions for political movement in behalf of the good, the just, the true. Describing the company around Martin Luther King Jr., Lash noted that these supposedly culturally backward people showed more confidence in the goodness of things than those who enjoyed fuller access to the fruits of scientific enlightenment. Their experience in the South, he wrote, gave little support to a belief in progress, yet they seemed to have unlimited supplies of hope. Social theories that equate moral enlightenment with cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism cannot begin to account for these things, he said. 
hope, trust, and wonder were what they possessed. These three names for the same state of heart and mind. Above all, he thought, they had spiritual vitality, what he termed simply virtue. After studying Lash for many years and after hours of conversation about him with those who knew him well, I'm still not exactly sure what Lash was affirming here in terms of a theology. But I am confident of this. However any of us defines goodness, we can all agree with him that goodness is not automatic for any person or people. That we all as individuals and communities require intervention of some sort, of many sorts. In a recent Orion essay, Fred Bonson writes, in view of the ecological crisis, that we need a deeper form of political engagement, one that leads us to confront the darkness of the human heart. Here, Bonson simply echoes what Walter Lippmann, in his anguished 1955 book, The Public Philosophy, called for when he warned that looking back at the previous half century, liberal democracies had become, quote, sick with some kind of incapacity to cope with reality, to govern their affairs, to defend their vital interests, and it might be to ensure their survival as free and democratic states. Neither Lash nor Bonson nor Lippmann is here calling for conversion. Theirs is first, in fact, a call for a deeper liberality, a liberality that creates space and invites voices into it who believe that what we are as people constitutes at best a challenge to our own high purposes and is all too often a defeat of them. It's a call that affirms with Lash that, in his words, the danger to democracy comes less from totalitarian or collective, collectivist movements abroad than from the erosion of its psychological, cultural, and spiritual foundations from within, close quote. A democratic republic may in fact become a haven that stays off the tyranny history so predictably reveals, but only if we, the Democrats, the Republicans, the left and the right, only if we ourselves are alert to our own most troubling tendencies and are at the same time alive to a goodness that can, in the end, defeat it. Thank you. Hi, Andrew. <laughs> Thanks for that. Is this on? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, as you know, there was a time when I thought I wanted to write an intellectual biography of Lash. Um, reading your book cured me of that <laughs> affliction because you did such a great job. There was not much more to do, even with the minor disagreements I might have had. Um, so everyone should read the book. Um, but during that time, I uh, talked to several Lash students, including Kevin Matson, but also David Steigerwald, who concluded similarly to Matson, although I think from a position closer to Lash's, that Lash had an unrealistic or nostalgic view of the working class or the plebeian sort of attitudes in American. Yeah. Like, Lash did not um, really see the degree to which um, they had been consumed by consumerism, I guess you might yeah. say. Um, do you think this, you address this, and you seem to disagree with this, you seem to think that Lash addressed that or anticipated that criticism, but do you think others have accused Lash, uh, like James Livingston, of like being um, in the world but not of it? Yeah. And always sort of thinking from very idealistic or um, nostalgic or utopian perspectives and not really sort of having a firm grasp of how to get from here to there. Do you think there's something to that or how would you address that? I think there's something like that going on, but I think that's not true enough to say that I agree with it. <laughs> uh, and I never met him. I'm sure that uh, 30 minutes of conversation would give me insight that I've been, you know, and that's just a biographer's or a historian's fate. But um, one of his former students made some kind of a comment to the effect at one point that uh, Lash lived in books. 
and that, uh, that there was this conception of reality that was so filtered through theoretical and analytic frameworks that this was a tendency of mind that he had. And I think that's what seems convincing to me. The fact that La the idea that Lash was utopian or some sort of idealist, I completely disagree with that. I don't read his books and get the glimpse of somebody who's trying to lead us to some promised land that we can really get to. Uh, he, he falls, if there is a kind of optimistic, pessimism continuum, continuum he's not on the optimistic side. Uh, so his books to me read as if he's always goading you toward the necessary, the, the essential thing that you need, not the maximum. Um, and I think that's why Freud was such a, a compelling figure for him at this decisive moment when the new left had, when the left itself had collapsed in the early 70s and he was looking for something to help him make sense of what was happening. This more reflected his, his anthropology, as it were. And so I think that, um, I think that uh, how he thinks about the pot, how he thinks about ordinary Americans, the common man and that kind of thing, it's curious because this is his stock. His, uh, he had a grandfather who, who ran a grain, opera, a, a grain operator. His parents were very highly educated and he didn't grow up in that world. But he had some sense of everyday connection with that in, in, some, in some way. But in terms of his, his life, his whole life was lived in the, in the classes that he was talking to, that is with the educated classes. So yeah, I, I don't, I, there's something to it, but I still think that he understood the criticism and responded to it and was trying to defend people that I think he saw as unjust, unjustly, uh, unjustly, unfairly dealt with as, as, as fellow citizens, in a, in a sense, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, to, to continue on that, on that uh, note, and thank you for that terrific talk, and as you know, I'm uh, uh, also quite an admirer and fan of Lash's work, um, but I've been thinking a lot about what Lash might say today, so I'm asking mm -hmm. a little more of a speculative question, what he might s say today, um, especially in light of the fact that when he writes, um, thinking especially in parts of the first chapter of the, um, uh, the, um, uh, sorry, the, the book. True and only had The last book. Uh, the Revolt of the Elites. Revolt of the Elites, thank you. The Revolt of the Elites, uh, where he talks about the kind of, the unreflective virtues of ordinary people. Mm -hmm. uh, that these are kind of, these aren't intellectual conservatives, they just kind of right. live a con kind of conservative way of life as mm -hmm. just a matter of course, whereas he sees the, uh, the elite intellectual classes or the kind of managerial class as living lives that are, you know, sort of self-interested and um, uh, not, not committed to any, any particular kind of community and so forth. And yet, in looking at some more contemporary kind of social science research, I'm thinking here of something like Charles Murray's book, Coming Apart, or mm -hmm. um, uh, um, uh, uh, Robert Putnam's book, Our Kids, what we see actually is a kind of almost a sort of reversal of those yeah. claims or a refutation of those claims that it's in many ways the, the elites of our society, the, the college right. educated and so forth, who are forming to the extent that families are being formed, yeah. uh, that are staying married, that are not divorcing, mm -hmm. uh, uh, whereas it's our kind of working class today, yeah. um, uh, treated, for example, with great denigration by Kevin Williamson, for example, who are experiencing incredible social breakdown and yeah. don't evince these kinds of Right. Conservative virtues. Yeah. What, do you, what do you think, based yeah. on everything you've read of, that a lot. of Lash, yeah. where, where he would kind of how he would evaluate this condition? Yeah, today? I think the social indicators take a dive in this. Uh, you know, in the years after his his passing in '94, and I think to me it underscores the validity of that criticism of his argument that the populist tradition really wasn't this. Not that he ever depicted it as it a robust, thick. You know, every you know go to some corner of America and find a populist and it'll be a hardy society. That wasn't his, his image, but I think it did, um, it did underscore a kind of thinness in his understanding of this. Uh, I think what he felt, I think he knew that there was something that, that felt like what he ever, whatever he understood a real culture to feel like, going back to some of the Philip Reef arguments that he was connected to, that there's such thing as a real culture of interdictions and then there are anti-cultures. And I think he knew uh, that there was something in ordinary American life that was missing in the rarefied world of the upper middle classes that had gone through this mo cultural modernism, cultural modernizing sort of. And I think that that's what he was trying to get people like himself to say, it's really out there. If you go, you know, <laughs> if you go talk to somebody, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're going to discover something that feels different from the world uh, that, that we live in. Um, one of the things actually that made me think that there was more validity to this was when I realized how closely uh, 
his thinking was uh, following the same track that Wendell Berry's was on at almost the exact same time. In fact, almost, they're born two years apart. And if you read their works side by side, it's like you're reading people thinking out of the same mind almost. But they, Barry never read Lash. Um, uh, I wrote to him once to ask about this. I was so struck about it. And he wrote back to me and said, I, I don't know Christopher Lash. I don't. Um, but if you read The Unsettling of America, which comes out, I think, in 77, and if you read The Culture of Narcissism in 79, um, you're getting a, a portrait of the same kind of American um, tendency that they both see. And I think that that's, a, that's something of a historical argument to make, that they must have been, you know, there must have been something that is certain, uh, you know, that, that you could perceive there. Um, but I also think that what he would feel was enormous sadness, that he was also right, when he's, that the forces that he was so deeply concerned about were so powerful that they were able to devastate what there was of this Republican, small r, populist culture, the world of working class Americans, you know, somewhat eth you know, segregated in different ethnic groups and that kind of thing. But it had, it, had been, it had been thinned out to the point where, and his whole point, of course, with narcissism wasn't that Americans were, were more selfish, it was that we had become weaker. Um, as human beings, that we had lost, and you know, this is where he's looking for language. Uh, he, he, you know, he doesn't use words like character or that kind of thing very much. But uh, Solzhenitsyn, in his, you know, his uh, notorious Harvard address, um, also at the same moment, describes what he calls uh, his quotation is the weakening of human being in the West. The weakening of human being in the West. That's what Lash was also trying to describe, and his recourse was to Freudian categories to, to try to get at it. But that was the sense that there's something, we're not strong enough. Gene Elshtain, um, in a First Things essay, sometime in the early 21st century, <laughs> which we're not in now, apparently, <laughs> uh, sometime, uh, you know, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, wrote about this sort of, that our problem is that we have these selves that are unable to, uh, we're not strong enough to to stand up and have contention with one another, and so that's why we're retreating into these, um, into these identity niches and that kind of thing. So I, I think that's the I think it's that line of criticism that they're trying to develop. That there's this deep psychic dimension that's been you know that, that's been eroded some. Yeah. I think it would, uh, I think Lash's tendency to interpret uh, his belief in a strong material dimension to, you know, to human well-being is that, that these are the people who have the power. They have money, they have the wherewithal. I think he would say that in a kind of functionalist way that uh, human beings need families. Uh, we don't do well without families. Uh, in the, one of his, uh, speaking of no notoriety, one of his, um, interventions uh, in, in the, the last stage of his career, it was, there was a Harper Symposium where they gathered together five or so intellectuals to ask if you could come up with a constitutional amendment to add to the U.S. Constitution, what would it be? And he basically said, if you have children, you're not allowed to divorce. <laughs> and you know, Benjamin Barber's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, I, and the, you know, the Harpers <laughs> recreated the transcript to make sure that Barber's line came in right in the middle of Lash's statement. Um, but Lash said, hey, there's just, uh, his, you know, he says, read, read, read the evidence, read, read the statistics. Divorce is bad for kids, period. You know, if you have kids, stay with your kids. When they're gone, then you can make a decision. Um, so I think he would say that, yeah, that materially, uh, you know, these, this, is, this is who we are as, you know, as a species, as creatures. We need these kinds of forms. We need these frameworks. We need these structures. And the people who have the money are eventually going to find their way towards creating these for their own survival. It's a, kind of a little bit of an evolutionary argument that way, yeah. Thank you, Eric, for your talk and your deep knowledge of your subject. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious what you think, you know, as a Lash scholar and Lash scholar, and, and what you think he might have thought um, about this whole phenomenon. 
with Facebook going on right now. And let me just try to tie together a couple of the strands of what you've been talking about. Uh, concern not just about the overarching state, but by the overarching power of corporate capitalism. Mm -hmm. Obviously, his concern with a culture of narcissism, which obviously Facebook has mm -hmm. watered, you know, given and given given uh, fodder to that. But at the same time, uh, it's also with his emphasis on that we uh, need participation. Mm -hmm. We need participation. And one could argue that Facebook in its best, sorry, I don't know how to turn these things off. Uh, Facebook in its best entities, in its best uh, manifestations is something that helps people to participate more within a civic society, right? People can yeah. um, ask questions of each other, answer. There's not the utter anonymity mm -hmm. of those nasty comments right. that were, were discussed in the last session. And, and yet, um, when you look at Facebook exerting corporate control, mm -hmm. it's not hurting anybody's narcissism, right? So they're, they're not getting in the way of that, but they might be getting in the way of people's participation yeah. in terms of corporate control. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that phenomenon. Yeah, I mean, Lash died in 94, just, I, I think he had email just before he died. So, that, you know, where he was and how he was thinking about this was, uh, it was a different world, but, um, I think that Lash's eye was always on the political requirements that we had uh, and then the, that would make possible the fostering of the decent society and the healthy human beings that that required. And I think he would be trying to make the careful discriminating judgments like we all are of at what point is this going to serve our truer and the true and only heaven uh, that, that he had in mind for us uh, in a kind of republic or and to what extent is it eroding it? And I, uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't one to, you know, I mean, he flew in airplanes, he drove cars. You know, he wasn't somebody who took a, um, uh, a harsh stance against technology per se, but he was very concerned about the effects of all the images and the interconnecting on our sense of self, as well as on our ability to create community. So I think he would find, um, yeah, he would be in the line of argument uh, like Gene Twenge, um, uh, Stephen Marsh, the people who are just, who are saying that this is, there may be a lot of good that's happening through these things, through that thing, perhaps at this very moment, who knows, but there's a, but there's, probably not, yeah, right. <laughs> but, uh, but there's a deeper, there's a deeper thing going on here and that's the thing we need to keep, and I think you'd be very wary then. I think he would be echoing people like Rebecca Solnit, um, marvelous piece Rebecca Solnit wrote um, a few years ago in which she said that we used, before the internet, Life was lived between two poles, solitude and communion. And we would go back and forth between these poles. Um, and now she says, we live in the shallows between two deep zones. And I think that shallows, he was allergic to that kind of thing. I think he would have no time. He didn't even like Bob Dylan, you know. And Gene Elshtain one time says she tried to, That's you know, terrible. get him to listen to Dylan late at night and they were at some kind of, he's like, you know, he turns on Mozart, you know. But, yeah. Um, so there's a, uh, you know, that's, I think that's what he would be, uh, yeah, he would not be happy with, with that tendency to shallow th our lives out. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. And sorry for the ding. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Thank you very much.